Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to ask Carlos more questions uh, rather than a conversation, I think. But you never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to happen. But I will say this. So I'm on my way to uh, uh, South by Southwest. And um, I'm in the airport, and I didn't. The plane was late from San Diego to Austin, and I ended up uh, meeting Eric there and a whole host of other people for about three hours. And by the time I was done, I didn't have to go to South by Southwest, but because I met everybody I needed to meet. But the, the, my point is, I'm sitting there, and I'm not sitting there. I'm walking around because I never sit in an airport. You can't sit anyway. I'm seeing Eric, and. He's got this out. That's that's right. And he's got a pencil, a pen in his hand. He's got the thing all like this. So every page is like, you know, creased over. He's right. I said, shit, nobody ever did that to my book. <laughs> uh, I go, what the hell? <laughs> Here's your guy. He loved it. I'm telling you that. And, and I did too, of course. And uh, I know the people in the book, quite a few of them. Uh, especially Bella from when she was like this big, literally. And so um, it's it's personal, uh, not personalized, which is different than personal. Um, you do something to somebody when it's personalized. And this is a book that's very, very personal. Um, and uh, I worked with Carlos a little bit, uh, just bouncing ideas off here and there. Uh, a little bit? Yeah, a little. No, no, you you really, you know, he took a long time to write this book, and, and, and there's very good reasons for that. It's, it's, an, it's a really, really personal book, and hard to tell the stories. But that said, um, I'm going to do a little bit of a format since I'm a jazz guy, but there's no music here. So I'm going to start with a few names of songs as I go through this and ask you some questions um, about the book. And the first one is um, A Love Supreme by John Coltrane. Because this is a love supreme, this book, and, and love looms large in the book. And so this is about how the book was written. I want to ask you a question about that. So there's letters in the book to people. There's data in the book. There's stories in the book. Um, and it's a very unusually written a book written in an unusual way so uh, i want you to talk about why and how you chose to write this book the way you did yeah for, first um i want to acknowledge how special it feels for me to be able to sit here with elliot right like there's to be able to sit with someone who is even let's say we hopefully we've all had moments in our journey where we perhaps didn't feel like we were worthy or capable, but someone else saw something in you and lifted you up in that way. That has been Elliot from day one. So I just, so this is, this is special, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, and because the book is so deeply personal, I've been able to this moment, be able to control who I'm in conversation with. So coming to San Diego, like, of course I wanted to do this. So I appreciate it. And your belief in this book, um, was, is deeply important. Um, and I never wanted to be an author. I never sought out to be an author, y'all, I promise you. Um, but in my journey as a teacher and as a principal, I encountered some pretty amazing young people in that journey that really shifted and impacted not just how I lead and how I teach, but how I show up in the world. Um, and there were these three, specifically three young men that are the center of this book who you know, sadly are no longer with us. And I wanted to, A, first do something that really honor their memory and their impact, but also an opportunity for us to hopefully start thinking about how we approach teaching and learning as a much more bi-directional engagement with young people, which I think also is deeply centered in humanity, right? And the need for us to continue to bring that into the profession and not lose track of that. Fortunately, love someone someone reached out and asked me if I was interested in, in writing a book. I had been floating it around with, with my dear friend and longtime colleague, Chris Jackson. 
around like if I wrote a book, this is what I would do. And I went down this journey and I had no idea how to how to go about it. So I, I'd also received a lot of support. And I wanted to do, do something that was, you know, folks out often ask, what do you want to change, right? Or, or how do you want people to react to, to your book when they read it? And I was like, think, I, I want them to A, pause and think about their interactions with young people in a, in, in a very different way. Um, but even more so folks that support the adults that work with young people is how do you love on them, support them, and show up for them in a different way that allows them to do their very best for our babies. And I wanted people to say it was beautiful, right? Like it was personal, it was beautiful. Um, so, and then in that, I also wanted it to be because it's easy to kind of live in the space of sadness because it's you're talking about a bit of loss, um, but there's also a lot of hope. And I hope that folks see that at, as you get towards the end, because there's some some powerful stories and letters to some young people who are thriving and doing amazing things in this world. Um, and this thing around vulnerability, right? This openness that I think is just necessary for us and how we show up. Um, not necessarily just with our young people, but for each other, right? We're too often showing up with our representatives. And I think two things that you saw really beautifully earlier today in the, in the open plenary was you saw Michelle and Dina not show up with their representatives, right? Their full selves, who they were, um, going with the flow. And I think that just, we just need that more in this space. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of once again, this book has uh, not just the stories of young people, but your own story in it uh, and talking about being vulnerable where most of us, you know, we tell stories about ourselves, but we kind of don't share them in writing. Mm. And 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 talk about how that felt and and what that meant to you in in putting this book together. Y'all, I'll share that Elliot and I intentionally did not connect as to what he was going <laughs> to ask me. So I'm I'm like like those pa these pauses that you see, they're not theatrical. They're like real <laughs> pauses. Like I'm like. All right, I'm not sure where you're gonna go next. Okay, so that this is very real. Um, <laughs> you can keep that in the podcast. Um, so the the intro again, I, I again great guidance that I got and suggestions around using the letter format to tell stories to uh, about these young folk. Um, I struggled really deeply with how to start that off, right? And I decided and landed on getting to a point where I, I wrote a letter to my younger self at a time where I was definitely, that I can recall, probably most vulnerable, most hurt, and had just had a pretty traumatic experience. Um, kind of happened to me as a 15-year-old young man. I was like robbed at gunpoint on my way home from school by like two two dudes, right? And, and I just spiraled after that, right? I became, I went from, actually, I do have a picture, I think, Wait, I went from like like that, right? A, a, you know, a, like a, a very kind and happy and and kind of go with the flow young man to someone someone that was that was in the streets. I became a real diff different person, and part specifically because of safety reasons, right? I started hanging out with the cats on the block because I was going to make sure that, and they were going to help make sure that that didn't happen to me anymore. Right. And that's not that's not a rare story. Right. This is what often we often see in young people in, in a variety of communities and the choices that they make. And we think they're just making them to make them. But there's an underlying story um, and reason for that. So I was in that space. So what I chose to do in this in, as an opening in the book is to write a letter to my younger self and and say all the things I had I wish someone would have said to me in that time. Um, so I didn't have to make these, some of the decisions that I made. Um, and, it, and it, I think for me, it emphasizes the importance of us when we're working with young people or supporting folks that work with young people is to do our inner child work and make sure that we're well before we try to help others, right? If we broke, break up, if we show up fragmented and hurt, then we cannot help anyone else. So it's just, it was a reminder of like what I had learned from working at, at the Met and within Big Picture, but then also putting into practice 
I was like, all right, put yourself out there, right? If you're going to do this and tell the stories of others, you need to connect it to yourself also because there are so many shared similarities that I had with these three young men, all, all, all young men of color, um, all coming from urban communities, all coming from loving homes, mm -hmm. right? Which we don't often say, but also came from very loving right. homes with parents that cared for them and did their very best for them. Um, and that there were still all these other factors that they just couldn't control, societal factors and, and beyond. So, so I chose to start, start that journey that way, write that letter to myself. Yeah, that's one of the things that make this book very, very unique. And uh, the whole process of the book as it unfolds is like that without giving too much away for those of you who haven't read it like Eric. Mm. But there's also this um, uh, a song by Nat King Cole, Three Little Words, They're different words. Go ahead, Elliot. One of his love, but it's vulnerability, love, and care, mm. like TLC, VLC. And a lot of times now, people talk about leadership as a science, teaching as a science. Th this book has data in it, lots mm. of it. It has the science side, but it also has the craft side of finding your leadership soul, which is, I always think of our work as craft, not as science. So I, I'd love for you to talk about how how you found and everybody finding their leadership soul through a craft and as well through, yep, you got to have the research. You got to know what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I firmly believe we're all informed, right? Like our lived experiences is, informs who we are as people, right? And we continue to grow and, and learn and evolve and that never stops, right? It's not like, oh, you're now 30 something, you're a leader of an organization you're still growing and evolving and learning and the experiences that you're having impact how you show up. Um, I feel like my foundation around leadership soul was the support and what I had at home with my parents. And I do talk about that in different experiences and moments that I had that I felt really well and deeply supported. Um, so that was a first layer. And then, you know, there's college. I talk about all these things, but it's interesting you say that. So these young folks are my advisory. So then I, I landed at the Met, uh, Big Pictures Founding School, and I met these 16 amazing young people who I got to spend four years with as their teacher, as their mentor, as their guide. And now we've evolved into this like really deep friendship. And one of the things that I had learned and you know, young people will always tell you, they'll remind you and show you what you don't know. They will absolutely point you out and be like, and if you, and if, and they can also show you some grace, right? They can also show you some grace. So there, 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 are, a number, there are a number of instances over the course of four years. And if you consider being with the same group of 16 young people over four years um, and working with them really deeply and wanting to, you know, get to know and understand all their interests and what they're excited about, knowing their families, right? Knowing their families, knowing, and you, over time you learn their histories. Um, it gives you a very different perspective on a lot of things. Um, so the development of, of like leadership soul, right? It, it is what I, what I appreciated about making the leap into education um, as a non-traditional educator was that I wasn't forced to just become a technical educator, right? Like there's a conversation that that currently exists and I heard Dina say it earlier and I've said it kind of in a, in a slightly different way is that if if you love the idea of teaching X, right? Enter whatever content area, right? more than you love the idea of working with young people, you absolutely That's should right. not be in the profession. You can't love your content area or this idea of working in this very just like singular way where young people are not singular individuals. Like we're not singular people, right? So that 
in essence, is a big part of what leadership soul is. It's it's like this focus on the humanity, right? It's the way I I with these young people, how they demonstrated love and care and vulnerability towards me, right? In ways that I just didn't expect, right? Because of the design and because we were the way we were set up. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm gonna read something from the book. That no, you're not. I, well, I can have you read it. No, I don't want to read it. I don't want to read it. <laughs> I don't want to read it. I don't want to read it. <laughs> but it, it 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 plays into almost exactly what you said. I didn't know that was going to happen. Oh, good job. And and, it, and uh, the title of this song is uh, by Pearl Bailey. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Um, in your book, you state uh, education reform efforts have only exacerbated these persistent inequalities by advocating policies and practices that ignore structural barriers like racism, segregation, and poverty. Too many currently celebrated ideologies and mm -hmm. practices suggest that attitude adjustments, self-control, grit, and bootstrapping are the foundations of success. These out-of-touch pedagogical approaches alienate black and brown students and diminish the invaluable role of informal learning experiences. The love I speak of throughout this book transforms caring and vulnerability and is at the heart of my leadership soul. Caring without love is intellectual and technical, bounded and constrained. And, and, and it really does speak to what you said about the technical part of what this is and the, and the craft that you must develop with young people as, as you do this work. So can you respond to that paragraph a little bit more about the policy side of it, about the policy oh, side? Man. You know, that this, this was presented to educators in professional development and teacher training for 20 years, and researchers, by the way. And yet it goes against a lot of what we know as craft and leadership soul. Yeah, I'm going to go out. I'm, I'm going to say something, and then I'm going to allow this to stay in the podcast, if that's cool. So I won't name the names. But when I transitioned from being school-based, I'll give an example to what you're asking. Mm -hmm. And you'll remember this, because I was, I was pissed. <laughs> um, when I, when I transitioned from being school-based to working within systems or with systems, I had moved from Providence to New Jersey, and I was doing work with Newark Public Schools. Some amazing educators and folk in Newark, New Jersey, just amazing humans. And there had been, you know, when I arrived, there had been some changes in district leadership. Mm -hmm. And I remember that you joined me for a meeting I know what you're talking My about. My hand is shaking, right? That's yeah. how that's how tight I am. We're not going to talk about that. I remember this. Yeah. And this is like, y'all, this is 13 years ago? At this least, is, this yeah. This is 13 yeah. years ago. This is 13 years ago. Yeah. Um, 12 to 13 years ago. And I remember that this, this new leader of the district, this new superintendent had come in and had said, you know, like it was meeting with all these folks that were starting new schools. In fact, that we were asked to open, right? We were invited. We didn't pitch. We didn't sell. We were asked to open this new innovative school that centered young people, which is what we had been doing in many places, mm -hmm. which we had a really powerful example in Camden, Univ uh, Camden, New Jersey, that was thriving and doing amazing work. So the proof we even within the same state existed, same population Right. And I explained, I sat there and explained with tremendous detail to this new superintendent about what this model was and how we do it. And they also asked a lot, like a lot of questions, right? And thoughtful questions with, that I felt. And at the end, all I remember hearing is, oh, that's really hard to do. And I'm like, you damn right, it's really hard to do, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's not easy, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And totally killed K 
killed the opening of the school after we had successfully recruited 150 families that I personally was out in front of recruiting to come to the school, right? I'm out in the community telling, telling, young, telling families about this school, right? And we were, we've been around at that point for 20 years, right? We had proof points across the country and in the state. We had data. We had data. It was hard. It's hard, no doubt. And yep. gave really no excuse and no support in helping me and us find alternative placements for those families. So we had to kind of bootstrap it right ourselves and we figured it out. Fortunately, we had some other schools already in, in, the, in the community. So we was just like, here's the other option. It's not the new school, but, but I, I share that example because that's what it is, right? It's, it's this notion of what is hard, right? Often folks like are asking, right? Like, how, because it's so difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And my, my response is always like, yes, it is hard. And we've figured out ways to do it. And I think that that's a model. That's one model, but there's so many other models that exist that are doing an amazing work and have figured it out. But because it's hard, it's not a reason not to do it. And that's what gets me hot, right? Like, like when you give me that, that's your reason. Yeah. And that, that we're not going to do it because it's hard. That means you just want, you just want something that's simple. You want something that you can cookie cut, right? You want something that you can easily scale, right? Right. 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 And you're not thinking about the individuals, right? You're not thinking about the impact. You're not, you're not considering all the other things. So for me, that's, that's, that's one of the main reasons why I, I, I believe that it's been so hard in different, land, not just for us, but for some others to get some traction in some of these things because the, the questions around how difficult it is, what are the, all the things that you need to do to be able to get there? How much time we got before? Three and a half minutes. What? Before, before, Q, before questions, before questions. You kidding? Three and a half minutes? Absolutely. Right, I got what, what Michelle said. What Michelle said, Elliot. We do what Michelle says. I know that. Yeah, I, yeah. I just okay. ask, I'm just asking. <laughs> no. So, so, Nat King Cole's brother, uh, Freddie Cole, wrote a song. I mean, you don't know who, probably who, who Freddie Cole is, but he's an incredible. Don't piano assume they don't know. They might know. They might know. I, who knows? They might know. I'll give you a free book if you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So he wrote a song called What Now, My Love. So what now? You have Ashe, Equity Fellows, which in a, is an instantiation and an mm. example. And people may not know Ashe and Equity Fellows in the room. And an instantiation of your beliefs in that manifest in leadership soul. There's no two ways about it. That's what these two initiatives do. So what now, my love? There's examples. Mm. Talk about Ashe, talk about Equity Fellows, and talk about what now. Yeah. I'm loving this the music theme thing. Thank and so you. it's pretty, that's fly. I appreciate that. Um, so I, I I think those are all not not necessarily just extensions of me and leadership soul, but extensions of us as an organization. Beautiful. Right. So I just need to say that, right? Like, um, because in any every one of those initiatives, it's not just a Carlos initiative, right? It's been in in, in community and in great thinking with a lot of folks within the, across the organization. So it's who we are, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Um, so the two fellowships, um, Equity Fellows, is one that is focused on supporting K through twelve leaders. Um, from all levels, right? So it is from your teacher leaders to your state superintendents. Like we've had this really beautiful mix of, of folks in any given cohort that is not just for like folks who have held a certain like level, right? It's just, it's an opportunity to bring together all the folks that impact schools and systems together to learn together, um, grow, and then have an impact to bring deep learning practices to their to a particular community. So we're really proud of, of Equity Fellows. It's in, we're on our sixth cohort and hopefully we'll be launching the seventh That's in right. the, uh, in the new year, mm -hmm. the new calendar year. Ashe is a newer one. So it's, it's inspired by Equity Fellows Ashe. and Ashe, um, Ashe Leaders Fellows, which was co-designed with our friends at the Hewlett Foundation, 
who were the earlier supporters, early supporters of Equity Fellows, and and it aligned with really supporting community leaders. So we selected specific communities where folks of color were not having access to personalized learning and this focus on civic education, right? Which I think is so desperately needed right now. And recognizing that the solutions in some of these communities because of their size of the community doesn't have to squarely fall on the shoulders of the school districts, right? So we have represent a representative, a senior leader from that school district, along with a number of community members. So we have city council members as part of specific um, ASHE teams. We have school board members. Um, we have folks from this, uh, the mayor's office in different communities. Um, and I want to acknowledge that those, those communities are Baltimore, Maryland, Jackson, Mississippi, Oakland, California, Akron, Ohio, and Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some amazing folks. And if you know anything about any of those communities, um, there's, there's just, there's so much great potential and brilliance that exists there. And then you didn't ask this, but leadership journeys is a big one, right? Which yes. we're going to be doing tomorrow night. Big plug. Uh, if you've been to leadership journeys, make some noise. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's going to be real special because uh, it is a homecoming. I haven't, I can't, I can honestly say I have not been this excited about a leadership journeys because of the featured leaders and the love that I have for them. And I'm like, I, it, it's just going to be different. If you're going to be our on own, the stage our, tomorrow, stand our own, up. Our own Michelle Pledger is going to be one go. of the featured leaders, y'all. So, so, all right. If you had other plans, no, no shade to the other, the other great events that are happening, but. I think I, yeah, you, you may want to think, think about your options. Um, <laughs> um, but Get leadership, there early. Yeah, yeah, tr tr true. So Leadership Journeys is an opportunity to have leaders that I believe kind of exemplify what leadership soul is and how they show up. Mm -hmm. And they're sharing about their journeys in the way that I think I did in, in, in finding your leadership soul. They're talking about their learning in really profound ways. And they're like, just, just, they're just like walking the walk, right? Like in, in that truth. Um, and the hope is that folks see that and experience these stories. And for some folks, they're going to be, they're going to be like, some of it is going to resonate and they're going to yeah. be like, yeah, yeah, this is, and some of it won't. Some of it is very unique to each individual leader that shares like just deeply and, and profoundly. So, um, and there's celebration in all of that, right? There's music, there's dancing. I was able to finagle with our friends to get a little wine in there, right? So we're going to have some wine. Was, there wasn't so, going to be wine? No, we're not going to talk about oh. that. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. Of course. What? Yeah. It's a school, Lel. It's a what? school. It's a school. We got to forget. It's, it's a school. Don't forget. So no, it's, 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 a, it's a celebration of leadership. It's a celebration of courage. It's a celebration of truth and honesty. Um, and I can't be, I couldn't be more excited about the leaders for tomorrow. I'm just... Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be beautiful. These oh are these are a we, <laughs> Ashe and Equity Fellows and leadership journeys, and it, but they emanate from people who come together and self organize and put and put it all together. And it it, it is a, a tribute to Los about the work that he continues to do as a craft, and and put these pieces that are so necessary forward. So. Thank you, thank Let's you. give I'll, Elliot I'll receive. I'll and Carlos receive. I'll receive. some love right now. Okay. So now we've reached the portion where you're no longer eavesdropping. You're here. You're alive and visible, and I know you have questions. Thank you, thank you. So go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll come over with the microphone, and you'll just speak directly into the mic. We're going to start with the lovely Nikki Hinostro. Thanks so much. Uh, up, for the discussion. Hey, though, so I'm happy to be here. Um, I want to know a little bit about what a current struggle is that you're in um, and how you're leaning on your leadership soul uh, to kind of work through. It's a great question. Um, there's never a shortage of struggles. I think the pause is figuring out which one to share. You know what I mean? Um, I think we know who we are as an organization 
and what our values are. And we also know what's happening in the world around us. Um, and one of the things, which is fortunately not just on my shoulders, but our collective shoulders is, you know, we've historically been pretty proud about being the type of organization that takes a stand, right? We're like, here's our statement, like take it or leave it. Um, and we're faced now with the reality that we need to be slightly more careful when we do certain things because of the impact and our ability to stay, to quite honestly, to be able to remain in it for the long haul. And that's really hard. That's really hard. And as a leader of the organization, right, as a leader within the organization, um, it's hard when you really want to put something out and you want to support your team and and then and then be like, I don't think we need to do that right at this moment because it could really have catastrophic a catastrophic impact on us. Um, and I'm thankful for the push that I get and the challenge that I get from my colleagues all the time around doing that. It's it's, it's like that tension that is always there. It's it's there. It's always kind of existed, but right now I just, I feel it different. I feel it real different. Um, and what I need to do is I think, what I try to do is remind myself what I'm grounded in and why I'm making a decision that sometimes may not be the most popular one, right? That it's in the best, the betterment of the broader organization and our ability to stay there, right? And be here and stay relevant um, and different ways to like pick and choose your fights right? When to put out a statement, when not? What are the other things that we can do? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a really, that's a real one right now. And I say that with a lot of my colleagues in the room, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I know they're probably like, yeah, what you gonna do, bro? <laughs> All right, who else has a question? Hello, thanks for sharing your thoughts and the great conversation. Um, I have full admission I have not read your book, but I plan to. But um, I'm sensing some themes already from our speakers at the, con at the conference. And that theme so far, one of them seems to be vulnerability. So as someone myself who's trying to work to be more vulnerable in my daily interactions with individuals, mm -hmm. what advice might you give me or others that are trying to do this work and be vulnerable in those spaces and at those certain times, given your experience and the way you wrote your book. Um, I'm gonna riff a little bit. So um, I'd say don't force it. Like force, vulner force vulnerability is just performative, right? Like, so there, there are these moments where it just, it'll feel natural, it'll feel right, it'll feel appropriate depending on who you're sharing with. I think one of the things about vulnerability, um, I don't, it's more than just an action, right? It's a way of just being and showing up. And what I've cautioned to folks in the past is just like, sometimes when you're vulnerable and share, and if you're not careful, you can actually do more harm than good. So the essence of why it is that you're choosing to share something um, to connect with someone, to affirm someone, something that someone shared that perhaps, you know, you want to kind of step out and you have a connection to or with, or you're trying to build a connection to with. Um, and also, like, just again, take your time with it, right? It's not like coming out and just sharing all of your, you know, all of your challenges, all of your struggles all at once. Like, that's a lot. Like, if you if you came to me right and I and I and I try to show up in really empathetic ways, I'd be like, bro, that's a lot. <laughs> like that's a lot. Man. Like who are you talking with? Um, so, yeah, I think I think just the, the being thoughtful and just kind of going slowly. Do you want to add to that at all? Yeah. Uh, yeah well, I'll just I'll be brief, just because I'm never brief. But uh, I'll just say that uh, when you talk about time. You know, 
we really got that wrong, time and everything. And I would say acceleration is a trend, not a law. And using a, a story that I was told, uh, if you go too fast, sometimes you got to wait for your soul to catch up with you. Mm. So I'll, I'll who, stop who, 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 quoted, who, who said that? I, we need to quote that. We need to quote that, bro. Can you, can you repeat that, though? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes you, if you go too fast, sometimes you have to wait for your soul to catch up to you. Eric, you got that? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you. I'll get it from you later, bro. I haven't read the book yet either, but I plan to probably tonight. Um, my question is in regards to advising and your connectedness. Can you talk about how, what you did during those hard times? You talked about three deaths. Um, so like, what are some of those like, how'd you make it through those moments and those, what are some of your, your self cares and your connectedness and the things that you did to, you know, weather through that? Yeah, <clears throat> I appreciate the question. Um, I'll start off with the really short and truthful and response is I didn't, I just kept going and, um, that's all sway. Mm. 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 Right? So I'm just not, so I can actually add, so y'all can see who they were. That's Andy. And that's Sean. Um, so with, with Josue and Sean, they were both in my advisory and um, they passed after they graduated, right? So they passed as young adults um, in very different ways and complete shock or complete surprise. Um, and where I actually found support like for myself was with those folks. Right, because we were grieving together, and we had shared this experience together. So I found a lot of, and again, I did not. One of the main reasons Elliot mentioned this is this book has taken a very long time, is because as I started writing it and writing these letters, um, it started unearthing things, and I was like, oh, I'm not well. I'm like a hot. I'm like a hot mess. I'm like really not. I'm not okay, um, and I really needed to pause. Right, because then I found myself not being able to move forward, um, feeling a lot of guilt and regret, and it it was really it was really challenging. Um, and then Andy, um, he pa I was his principal, and there's a different story with Andy that I I, I won't get into right now, but um, it was really difficult because. I felt like I made a really big mistake with Andy. Um, that if I hadn't made the mistake, I still continue to tell myself to this day that maybe the outcome would have been slightly different with him. Um, but this is why, I mean, what we heard really loud and clear from the stage today is the importance of healing and taking care of yourself and therapy. That is me, right? Right? And I do know that many black and brown men don't do it. Um, but it has, it has helped me tremendously in this and other things, right? <laughs> just in general maintenance, um, just really important for us to be well, right? Like, especially when we're talking about like working with young people, we got to take care of ourselves. Um, but the truth says that like when it happened, I was, I was just trying to thinking of thinking about the community, think about the, you know, the young people showing up for the families. Um, and then moving on to the next one. So, and that, that wasn't helpful. Very good. Let's go back to, um, 
you have us tearing up back here mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, you were sharing how we've lost students too, and it's hard. Absolutely. Um, and so my question is about the healing part. So what have been some lily pads or stepping stones that you have taken, maybe more than therapy, but if not, that's okay too, um, that has helped you to do your healing? Because um, I heard you when you said that we have to be healed or on our own healing journey to work with these precious babies that we get to. So curious what you would say, what wisdom you would offer us. Don't know how much of it it would be wisdom I've seen, but <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. That's, you already you you. <laughs> we know each we know each other for a lot of time. Uh, Casamigos. Um, no, 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 no. Like, not always, not always, not always. Um, I've I've those of you that have known me for quite some time. Um, I've been on a health journey. Right, like so, making sure I take care of myself and being well, um, not just mentally but also physically. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of support from my family, but also my colleagues in that journey. Um, it's beautiful because I like Ka Carla when we travel together all the time. We'd be like, "Los, we going to the gym." Like, man, let's go to the gym, right? Like we work out together. Um, we celebrate together, we, we find joy, and also pacing. I feel like I've gotten much better at pacing myself than I used to. And I know that so many of us, because we care so deeply about the work and we're like working tirelessly in hours, and it's sometimes I don't necessarily model it well for my colleagues, but the, the importance of being able to break in and, and like step away from it, I'm a lot more intentional about, um, like when I say I'm like really taking time off, trying to take, more, take, take, take that time. Um, surrounding myself with folks. I mean, I, I promise y'all, like, like I, I mean, I know Dina for a long time, but like to not surrounding yourself with toxicity, that, that is, that is, she said it. I was like, you are absolutely, that is draining. That is so draining, right? And just being mindful and protect, protect your heart, protect your soul again in the service of you just being well, but the, so you could do your very best for other people. Those have been some, I think some of the key things. And, and again, Casamigos every now and then. That's very real. <laughs> we have time for one last question before Carlos gives his final remarks. So I haven't read the book yet, but I do plan to read it. Um, the question that I have um, as a leader on a journey of founding and doing this work, one of the things that I am wondering about um, is how you... This is not necessarily like a self-care question, but this is more so about you You mentioned an experience where, you know, I sat at the table, I had this opportunity and basically what you knew, what you were, you knew what you were getting ready to do was the right thing. And then you experienced that, I would say, uh, loss in that potential profession, you know, like just for what you were experiencing right then, like you were about to make this move and then you lost that experience. So to speak, you had to regroup. Talk to me about how you've regrouped over your leadership journey and how ha how that has developed your soul, leadership soul, or how you're taking care of your leadership soul while you're doing all of that regrouping. And I'm sorry for the question being wordy. No, no, no. Oh, um, good. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat part of it just because I want to make sure I'm I'm, mm -hmm. I'm capturing it right. So, it you would you like to know specifically to the example I gave earlier? around sure i think you know just to be vulnerable a little bit just around like uh you know you're doing very daunt you've done very daunting work and thinking about how you did that work you know amidst all of the things and how you continue continue to ascend how you were able to take care of your leadership soul to keep going even now to do the work yeah um I talk about it a little bit. I, I appreciate the question because I feel it's a it's an appropriate timed question as well and where we are in the conversation. I talk a lot about at the end of the book around what I think folks should continue to do to preserve and and sustain themselves, mm -hmm. right, moving forward. So um, first is just, I, th I think what I list is the importance of being able to continue to grow, right, and, and like, 
like opportunities to continue to grow and expand your knowledge and your learning in ways that feels fulfilling and fruitful to you, right? Like, I think that's just important. We can find ourselves kind of stagnant and just kind of like, oh, right? But really trying to, and, and that, takes, that takes time and work. Connected to the next nugget would be, it's just like surround, like finding those trusted circles and places where folks are going to support you, but also challenge you, right? Like in really healthy ways and challenge you to be your very best, right? That love you and care about you enough to do that. Um, sometimes that's within your organization. Sometimes it's not, mm -hmm. right? And that's that, I mean, it's not that it's okay, but it's just the reality of what it is, is like finding those circles that fill you up. Um, I think it's important to even just in spite of what happens, sometimes it's important to be able to love with abandoned, right? And let some of it go and like hold truth that in almost most cases that folks absolutely, I'm about to say something that's not actually true. Uh, <laughs> um, what I was going to say is I, I need to believe, Carlos needs to believe that people innately want to do good, right? They don't want to cause harm, but I know that people have been hurt, right? And there are some assholes, <laughs> right? Like real talk, like there's some assholes, like, right? And, and we can often tell who those folks are pretty quickly, right? Um, but it's something that I need to be able to do to have belief in humanity and people, right? And, and, and I'm going to give you five minutes and we're going to be here. And if I'm, if I'm, if the vibe isn't right, I'm going to wish you the very best. And then I'm going to keep it moving. See ya. And I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's, there's definitely some of that in, in the book. So mm -hmm. yeah, I appreciate that. And now we want to give both of you a few minutes each to just share any final parting words that you would like to impart on this audience. And you can decide who goes first. You go first. Let me go first. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in the book, um, there's a there's a quote um, from my son, who passed, who also went to the Met. And uh, seeing it in writing, uh, and because that's who he was, the quote is, give love first. And he said that since he was a little child. But seeing it in writing, uh, was somebody else who, who, who caught him, his phrase, and knew him quite well, um, made me feel very, very different really really different so seeing it in the book so i i really thank you for that um of course it's a, it's a big deal mike 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 um mike was a beautiful soul um he and i had a uh, an interesting bond he graduated um before i started teaching at the met but he was always around because he was elliot's son uh which was which was cool but he he was he was y'all imagine a small like a younger elliot it was just that's who he was a, a talented musician, Very. phenomenal musician, and when Elliot had shared that quote, I just I like it's it's the opening to the it's one of the two quotes to open the chapter on love with Josue. So, so it's written on his tombstone. Yeah. So it's really. Yeah. And um, one of the things that in, as we you know again. There are a lot of beautiful memories of those young people, right? So I, as folks pick it up, it's like, hey, it's an opportunity for me to, uh, it was an opportunity for me to say some things to some of the young men's family members about all the things I appreciated, all the beauty that they brought to this world and who they were, and then kind of talk more about some of the humorous moments that we had, um, usually at my expense. Um, and and at, the, at the end of the book, there were, there were two final letters that I wrote that were um, to two young people that I believe just exemplify what's possible and the future generations of of this world and folks that you know often will be like oh they're up next they're actually here now like they've they're showing up we see it all the time 
Um, and one is to this young man, Michael Walters, who is a graduate of our school in the Bronx, Fannie Lou Hamer Freedom High School. Mm -hmm. Oh, BX, stand up. Let's go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> A beautiful soul. Uh, right. He has a really powerful story, which he he he. I was really honored that he gave me permission to share. Um, and he's off doing tremendous things. Entrepreneurial, entrepreneur, um, super talented, and and he just fills me with tremendous hope. And then the the last the last person was this this soul. This is my baby girl. All right, um, is Bella. Mm -hmm. And. What I wanted to do, and if I can, for the final, um, the final piece is read, read Bella's letter. So, um, and I'll say that when the publishers were like, hey, we're gonna do the, um, the letters in script, I thought it was the coolest thing, but it's not really easy to read. So, <laughs> so, please, so please bear with me a little bit, cause I'm like, and I read it like a few times, but it's, every time it's like super, super challenging, so. Um, it's just so small. And I'm <laughs> I know, yo, I, I and I got readers too. That's crazy. And I just I'm like, I'm not pulling out the readers, I'm not pulling out the readers. Um all right, focus for a minute. Okay. Uh, to Isabella Moreno. Bella, I'm up before dawn, gazing at the fading stars, and thoughts of you prompted me to write this letter. I cherish the opportunity to reflect on where I am on my journey as a leader and as the father of the most amazing or inspiring, that's inspiring, human I've ever met. I can think of no better way to conclude my most important piece of writing. These last few years of the pandemic proved to be chiflado, crazy. And the last few months have been especially difficult and challenging. I know that spending some of your high school years in quarantine and hybrid learning is not what you had hoped for or expected. Being quarantined for so long completely changed the way I think about time. Damn, that's really small. I, <laughs> I often lost track of what day or even week it was, but I'm eternally grateful for and appreciative of how much more time we had to spend together. Tonight, I find myself thinking about the future, your future. I have this image of you preparing to leave home for college off to Duke to join the rowing team. Mommy and I are so very proud and happy. Although I'm nervous about you leaving, I know that you are ready. You'll be fine. In fact, you'll be better than fine. You are brilliant, kind, compassionate, and just. You received an education that focused on learning and not just what not just test scores from a public school with resources for everything you needed from a rigorous and engaging curriculum to black and brown teachers who represented the diversity of your community. You are a reflection of what our country can be and what it needs. You are a natural leader and protector of those who need the greatest protection. The world would be a better place because of you. I'm reminded of young women like you, women such as Malela Yusfazi, Amanda Gorman and Greta Thunberg, mm. who have demonstrated that young people can make a difference. You are everything that we need. Did I ever share with you that some people wanted us to name you Milagros instead of Isabella? Milagros is Spanish for miracle. You entered this world four months early, weighing less than two pounds, but miracle would refer only to your birth, not your life. You are a fighter. You have always been strong in every way. You possess intelligence, beauty, and compassion. Isabella means beautiful, and you inherit the empathy and strength that Grandma Isabel, your namesake, carried until the age of 98. I pray your life is as long and as rich as hers was. The real miracle was the relentless love, patience, and compassion consistently demonstrated by the nursing staff at Women and Infants Hospital in Providence. The care and attention they showed you, me, and mommy was truly miraculous. They stayed alongside us on rough nights when, you, when your oxygen levels were dangerously low and celebrated your growth and progress. They modeled the ethos of patience, encouragement, vulnerability, and love that we needed to see and feel as new parents. We learned to be better parents because of them. I think of the nursing staff often 
as a dad, but even more as an educator. All that they did for us when our family was most vulnerable influenced the way I try to show up inside classrooms and schools. I try to carry this ethos in all my work. I could not have been prouder to see you take to the streets of our town in May 2020 wearing a mask to express your outrage at George Floyd's murder and to exclaim with pain-filled passion that Black Lives Matter. It was one of my proudest moments, watching you lead thousands of young people and adults in a march for some of our most basic human rights. You have known from a young age that freedom is never voluntarily given to the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Martin Luther King Jr.'s inspirational words ring out, ring out through your actions. Bella, you've seen how I've struggled looking back at my relationship with the young men profiled in the book. You're my child, but they were also part of my family. From them, I learned lessons filled with pain and hurt that I pray that you won't, you won't have to experience. You can lead differently and better. You can be more loving, caring, and vulnerable. You can and must make a difference. I know you will be a leader with soul in many ways you already are. A leader I know recently shared with me, love slows us down to observe more carefully and create new ways of being with one another. This is a kind of love many marginalized youth never experience. Still, there is no single movement in the history of this world that did not have young people at its forefront. Bring others to this quest for leadership soul. Practice and model love, care, and vulnerability. The system needs change champions who provide love and care for individuals and groups on the margins. I am confident that you and your peers can turn the tide for the new generation of leaders with soul. As I observe the state of our democracy, it is clear to me that we need now and new and better ways going forward. Major institutions are failing due to a lack of leadership, resources, and honesty. This is what keeps me up at night, Chiflado. We adults have work to do. Far too much of current leadership is rooted in intellect and selfishness, not soul. To overcome this state of affairs, leaders, including mothers and fathers and non-binary families, must focus on love, care, and vulnerability. I am committed to doing my part, but again, eventually, we have to get out of the way, pass the reins, and let the soul of the youth take the lead. The world needs you to fully realize the beautiful and amazing change, change maker that you are destined to be. I will end for now, baby girl. The sun is beginning to rise, and it's a new day. Love you, Dad. Thank you so much, Carlos and Elliot, for just sharing just glimpses of your leadership soul. Trust me, read the book for those of you who haven't read it. I can't believe they didn't sell it. I was like, people would have paid for it, but they are gifting it to you. So um, please read it and share it widely. And let's give one more round of applause for our incredible dance speakers. Thank you.